Uh, this is joint work with, uh, I would like to mention this is joint work with Gabriel Perret and Mathieu Bourdel, mostly, but then I have a lot of other collaborators on, in this, on this, in this line of work. So I'm sorry, the title is a bit long, so I try to stuff everything in it. So it's called Soft DTW, so DTW is Dynamic Time Warping, and Regularized OT, OT is Optimal Transport, and then it follows by Automatic Differentiation for Geometric Loss Functions. So I'm, I'm sorry for trying to put everything in it. Uh, so the, the, the main idea is basically, in machine learning, we manipulate, of course, a lot of structured objects. And uh, we, there have been some interesting distances for some of those structured objects. And there are two, there's two in particular that we'd be interested in, and that's time series and histograms, or probability distributions. And uh, for each of those, for time series, there is a very famous distance or discrepancy function called the dynamic time warping score or a discrepancy or whatever. And for histograms, there's something called optimal transport or Wasserstein distance. And what I will show is that they have a lot of things in common. First, they were proposed in the 50s or 60s, around that, that age where basically uh, dynamic programming and linear programming were formed. And so they were proposed having those ideas in mind. Uh, and then I will explain so in which sense they relate computationally. And then I will show that if one wants to use them in a, in a machine learning pipeline, that is use them not only as a way to, for instance, do retrieval, that is pick up the closest point to your query, but more, do more than that, that is use those distances as loss functions, then one might have to modify them a bit, make them a bit smoother or differentiable. And I will show two approaches for, for this. So the, the, the well, this one, mine, mine works, but doesn't seem to, to respond. All right, let me just see what happens. Yeah, it works, okay. So, so as I said, I will first do a very brief introduction on the DTW and optimal transport geometries. Um, I think this will be reminders for most of you. Uh, then I will introduce those regularized versions or smooth versions, and then explain how they can be used in practice to solve problems where the loss function that measures the, the adequacy between what you're, you're computing and what you observe is measured in the sense of uh, those, those soft quantities. So let me just start with uh, uh, dynamic time warping and, and, uh, and uh, oh, no, it's not working, so we just do this. Okay. Let me just start with the dynamic time warping. So the, the very basic idea is we have two time series of observations uh, supported on some metric space. So we have just points, and they are basically indexed by time, and we just want to find a flexible way to compare those two time series, and there is a, there is a nice uh, way to do so. It's basically to first start with a pairwise distance matrix, so we will fill up this matrix where each of the entries of x is matched with the entries of y, and we just compute a distance between them. No. Uh, Sorry. So first we will fill up this, this distance matrix delta. I call it delta, and you have delta x, i, y, j's. Then we just have this quadratic time operation. So it's, it's quite costly, but remember that we're in a very general setting where we know very little about the space uh, we, we, we are talking about, where the, 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 those time series take, take values. And then we will just try to solve a very general problem to compare those two time series. That is, we will try to align them. And aligning them means first that we will attach the their first, the respective first points together and the last points together. And then we'll try to find a way to basically align or match one point with another, okay? And we will allow for multiple matchings. So if I just start on the left, uh, top left corner here, the alignment problem is basically whether I need to match this point y1 to x2, point x1 to y2, or then just simply skip and just start matching uh, point x1 to uh, y2 to x2. So I have three cho choices here, and they are basically uh, the same as asking whether I want to go down, right, or down, right to in, in this matrix. And so if I, for instance, choose this uh, matching, then I, need, I have to ask myself the question again and again. And of course, you all know about this. 
we end up building an assignment, uh, sorry, um, uh, an alignment, and then we just try to think about what cost it might have. And the very natural notion of cost for this alignment is just simply to take the sum of all those cells that you have uh, walked upon during this walk from the top left to the bottom right. Of course, there's of course, a few very simple ways to start uh, to, to apply a small diet on this, on this uh, uh, alignment. You can just remove a few of the points that won't hurt in terms of the, that will basically reduce the, the cost. And of course, you will be better, you will still have an alignment. So the problem of uh, computing a optimal alignment is basically trying to find this, an alignment that goes from top, top left to bottom right, which, is, which has minimal cost. And we can, of course, cast this as the problem of finding a binary matrix that starts from top left and arrives uh, bottom right, and that satisfies some this monotonicity constraint. So let me just basically form formulate this problem. We will try to find the best matrix A, which has uh, binary entries, and then that will have to satisfy these constraints. And of course, what we know is that there's many of them. Of course, there's this one, this one, this one. And what we know is that the set of all uh, alignments that are valid is called the Delanoi, the set of Delanoi uh, paths on this, on this uh, uh, grid of size Nm. And it's of exponential size. And of course, we resort to Bellman recursions to compute this. We won't uh, be able to solve this exactly by just simply enumerating all of those paths. So what we just do is think about the problem. It has, of course, its very nice recursive structure. If you think about the optimal path that goes from, that connects this x1, x3 to y1 to y5. And we just give this cost, the name r star 3, 5, and do so for the other subpath, that you, sub problems that you can think of. Then, of course, the problem that you want to solve for this substring or subpath and substring here, and you get there. Well, the path that goes from here, top left, and has optimal cost and arrives here at, at, at this cell, of course can only come through either this cell, this cell, or this cell. And the best one is, of course, one that you will recover by taking the minimal cost of those three cells and adding the cost that you need to pay to go to uh, four or five, this cell four or five. And then you have here Bellman's recursion. And of course, the way you implement Bellman recursion would look something like this. Uh, most of us have done this in CS classes. So you just start by uh, updating the, this, this matrix, the cost matrix, you can do this, of course, like this, or you can do this like this by sweeping diagonally, and then you will update uh, the next the, the, the cells that you start seeing using the, the, the previous iterates, and then you just continue like this by applying uh, the recursion uh, to finally obtain uh, what you want and what you're seeking, which is simply this 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 quantity R five seven. Anecdotically, sometimes you might want to have the recover some optimal path, and you can very easily do so by keeping track of which, uh, which cell was the best one when you arrived at each of the cells here. Okay? So for instance, maybe the optimal path would be looking something like this. So this is what Sako and Chiba proposed in the 70s, and in, of course drawing inspiration from uh, Bellman's work on dynamic programming. And this has been going on, I mean, this has been used and applied for, uh, in, in many different domains to compute. Where there's very little we know about the time series themselves. It sounds like a reasonable way to have a, a score of discrepancy uh, between two time series. Now, let's uh, shift gears a bit and think about a very related problem, which is, which is not the problem of observing points in time, evolving in time from x1 to x5 and y1 to y7. But now it's the problem of looking at a um, at two discrete measures. So it's, it shares a lot of similarities. We are basically, in, we are again assuming that we are in some metric space. We have points scattered around. One is a, you might think that this would be the equivalent of the first time series and this is the equivalent of the second time series, except that this time there's no order. So we lift this idea that uh, observations are ordered. And what we add in exchange is we have weights. We have basically weights. And those weights are, are normalized this time. So in the time series case, we could have, for instance, uh, let's say five points in one time series and 10 in the other. Here, we will have different number of points, but somewhat there will be some normalization that will be such that the sum of the weights of the first measure is equal to the sum of the weights of the second measure. So this restriction can be lifted. In recent, there are many contributions in optimal transport that work on non-normalized uh, 
measures, but let me, let me just, for instance, for now, just uh, stick to this. So we have those points and those points, and we want to find, again, this idea of how can I somewhat uh, match or align this measure to this measure. And in the optimal transport case, which is a generalization of the optimal matching case, the optimal assignment case, what we will try to do is basically somewhat transport this, this point to this point. And I'm going to, uh, maybe this is a bit fast if you've never heard about optimal transport before, but I suspect many in the audience know about it. So what you try to do is something which is somewhat related to this DTW case, because what you first form is this pairwise distance matrix. So remember I called it delta in the earlier slides. Now I'm just it, going to call it MXY, where I'm basically computing the pairwise distance between all the points XIs and YJs in the two respective measures. Well, remember that in the assignment case I, have, I had mentioned, sorry, in the, in the alignment case I had mentioned this, uh, this matrix, binary matrix of entries that starts from the top left to end on the bottom right because it has this monotonicity constraints. Well, in transport, there's less somewhat constraints. It's a, it's a less constrained problem. What we just want it to ha is to have a matrix P that has row sums and column sums that, march, that match with the, with the marginals. So for instance, if this, were, if this was n equals n, m, m equals n, and the weights were uniform, this, cup, the, this set of uh, matrices would just be bistochastic matrices, OK? And the optimal transfer problem, again, and it looks a bit like this DTW problem, we're trying to find among a class of matrices of size n, m, that which has the lowest dot product so before we had delta, this is just mx white, the same thing. And then we take matrices within this polytope. So let me just mention that because this is a linear program, or and even more generally a convex problem, there is a dual, of course, for this problem, and it's it's the dual. This dual is basically what gave Kantorovich the Nobel Prize for his work on optimal transport. And let me just give you a brief um, intuition of what what makes this dual interesting. So remember that in the primal, in the, the problem I just exposed, I mentioned an n times m matrix and marginal constraints. The size of those constraints is basically n plus m. There is one constraint per row and one constraint per column. So we have a problem which has nm. We had, we had a problem that nm variables and n plus m constraints. So the dual, of course, will have n plus m variables and nm constraints. Okay? <coughs> and the dual is basically can be interpreted as follows. So suppose we have the, these two measures, okay, mu and nu. I run this optimal transport solver, which basically gives me, um, why can't it? Sorry, there's something that is, okay, now it works. Great. I understand where, where the bug comes from. So the, you remember this was the primal problem. And so in this case, I was looking for a matrix of NM entries with up to n plus m with with n, n plus m constraints. So if you know li about linear programming, you know that the, the optimal fact matrix can only have up to n plus m non-zero values. And so if you draw the optimal transport, basically you get these very intuitive pictures that tell you, well, if I want to transport this red measure to the blue measure, and do this optimally with respect to some cost, here it's just a Euclidean square Euclidean cost. Well, we need to map this mass to here. This map will be split. This map will, mass will go here. So you have something that's a very sparse transport, basically. Now, if you think about duality, we always think about duality in terms of prices. And this is, again, the valid interpretation here. What duality gives you, it tells you, well, if someone had to charge you to do this optimal transport and set a price for that, and that the price was set in the following way, the price scheme would be, OK, I'm going to transport this red to the blue. I'm not going to tell you how I do it, but I will charge you in the, using the following scheme. I will charge you some price to pick up one good at each of those red points. And I will charge you one a price, a different one, for each of the uh, places where I need to deliver, basically, the mass. Okay. So each of those points will have a, a price which will be attached to it. And the price will be, this is the price to pick up one item, one unit of mass here. 
and you will have different prices. This is the alpha here. And then there will be a price attached to delivering or basically transporting one any of, from any source one item at each of those red point, uh, blue points. And what you have by solving this, this optimal transport here, which by basically by duality, this is the same thing as the min, you have a set of prices. And what these prices tell you, well, first, they can be negative, because you can very easily say, I'm going to pay you to pick up something here. But then you just increase the price that you ask what to deliver, because that's, that's a zero sum game somewhat, if you just reduce the price here and, and increase it by the same amount here. And as you can see here, those are the optimal dual variables. And you can see some actually negative prices here. And then a lot of uh, more positive prices. And what this dual tells you is, when I compute the optimal transport distance between this measure and this one, well, the points that are really costly are the ones which have very high dual variables. Those are the ones that I would need to target or get rid of if I wanted this measure, red measure, look more like the blue measure. Okay. So this is very intuitive. If you ask me, how can I make this red measure closer to the blue measure? Of course, I would first get rid of this one, maybe, and this one here. Right? Those are the ones that really involve costly transportations. So this is about the duality in, 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 in optimal transportation. Now, if you look at this from a geometric point of view, what we have is just a linear program. So there's a polytope of feasible constraints for the matrices, and then a cost vector. And all of this is living in a space of matrices of size n times n. So the good news is that this, as, a, as far as linear program go, is an extremely efficient linear program. I mean, I told you about this, uh, this problem. I haven't told you much more than it's a linear program, but it happens to be a network flow problem. And so if you step back, here we have a problem which, whose dimension is basically n squared, okay, or nm. So let's say n equals m to simplify the argument. Basically, the data itself is given to you in n square form. We have all those pairwise distances. Yet I am telling you that I can compute the solution in n cube log n. That's very, very, very efficient. I mean, the theoretical complexity of linear programs is n to the, so the number of variables to the power 3.5. So here would be n squared to the power 3.5, so it would be n7. So this is very, very cheap. However, in practice, this is, of course, a bit too much to ask. Whenever we need to compare two histograms of two cloud of points, if we need to run the solver, the network flow solver, it can be very quickly, uh, I mean, of course, intractable. Then there is another problem, which is that if you know about uh, uh, network flow uh, solvers, well, they're not easy to implement. I mean, that's, that's one uh, issue that I have with them. I, I love the math behind it. Combinatorially, it's, a beautif it's beautiful math. But as we know, it basically takes this is a very simple solver, maybe the earliest one that was proposed in the community of computer vision. This is earth mover distance. And this code has 20 years, but, and it's very compact, but it's still a few hundred lines. So then, so we have, we have these issues with this, these two things. So to summarize a bit this short introduction to both uh, quantities, on the one hand, we have DTW. It's basically a linear objective. DTW has a finite set of uh, feasible matrices, it's all those Delanoi paths. It's not too costly, again, this is extremely efficient if you think about it. The amount of information that you have is basically what you need, is the same complexity that you need to compute the, the optimal path. We just made one sweep through this, through this matrix, and it's, it's very easy to implement. On the other hand, EMD is also, uh, also has this linear objective. We're trying to find, we're matching this matrix with a cost. Uh, in, EMD has a continuous uh, feasible set of matrices. It's cubic or supercubic, and it's ha pretty hard to implement. What also links both of them is that they are not differentiable in their inputs. And that's a, for me, that's a fairly big problem in, 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 if you want to use these quantities in machine learning. So this, this is costly, but both are basically not differentiable. So let me just try to explain to, 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 to um, to give a more precise or more intuitive meaning to, what I, what I, to this. So if you just look at uh, DTW, imagine that I have these two uh, time series, and I found the match, and I'm going to, or alignment, I should call it an alignment to be, to be uh, rigorous. And this is A star, OK? This is this, this matrix with a path. Now imagine that I want to look at what happens if I just change a little bit the inputs of my problem. And the input of my problem, of course, here, 
would be, for instance, changing a little bit the positions of this of those points x. So I'm going to do this very simple animation where I giggle. I mean, I, I change a little bit the axis, and hopefully nothing breaks down, and I still have this A star optimal uh, alignment. So what I changed, in effect, by changing the axis, is basically this cost matrix. Okay, so I'm not talking too much about how an impact the x impacts the cost matrix here, or the distance matrix, but let's, I will of course assume in most cases that this will be squared Euclidean, so the, this, this, this Jacobian will be very easy to compute. Now what might go wrong is, of course, if I just push things to the limit, then of course the optimal alignment will eventually change. And so then at that point, the optimal alignment cost, the DTW score, is no longer equal to this, to the, this A star. So if I just break down a bit uh, the math, I mean just the chain rule, we have that DTW is this minimum uh, uh, against all alignment matrices. If I want to differentiate, of course, I need first to differentiate the score with respect to the cost matrix, and then the Jacobian of the cost matrix with respect to the axis, okay? So if I want to compute the gradient, then I need to basically compute the transpose of this, and so I have this, the, 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 the transpose of my Jacobian, against this, uh, this uh, gradient. And the gradient with respect to the score matrix of this mean, of course, is not well posed. We know that the mean is not differentiable, but when the solution A star is unique, then things work and I have a gradient. If the solution is not unique, of course, things break down. So if we just further assume that, um, for instance, uh, the cost, so of course, DTW0 is piecewise linear with respect to delta. That's by definition of this. And because uh, the, the set here is finite. And if uh, we have this uh, cost, then basically what you get is that this function is piecewise quadratic with respect to the location. Now, again, if A star is unique, I get this. So what we have is that DTW0 has a discontinuous gradient. And let me just try to, to uh, illustrate this very simply by just showing this plot of the minimum of a family of uh, quadratic functions, okay? So of course we will have that the gradient with respect to x will be defined as long as you are in this area, but then as you can see it will very widely jump around if, as soon as you start switching to a different uh, optimal alignment. In the case of optimal transport, if I just go back to my <coughs> geometric uh, picture, then of course we have the same idea. P star, the optimal uh, matching, the optimal transport, is basically a vertex of this feasible set of uh, uh, joint couplings. And if I just change a little bit again intuitively my, my, um, my, my x, for instance, if I just uh, play around with, with it a little bit, then all of a sudden you get an infinite number of solutions, which is the entire phase. So of course this never happens in practice. Okay, it's very, very unlikely that if you have points sampled in a continuous space, that this will be exactly orthogonal to this. And this never happens. But what happens, if I just change a little bit the x, of course, what happens is I jump around, basically. My p star jumps around, and so my, again, my gradient here will basically jump around. And what happens is that this quantity, if I compare two discrete measures, mu and u, is not differentiable in the inputs. So there are two things to, so there are the, the, both DTW and optimal transport have this common issue, which probably goes back to their origins, which were, is that they were defined at the time where optimization was basically dyna dynamic programming and linear programming. And there's the, the, the main culprit here is basically this mean, right? It's a mean here in a set of finite uh, feasible solutions or even here in a, in a polytope. So there is one obvious way to get rid of the non-differentiability of a minimum operator, and it's, it's a soft mean, right? So the soft mean, as we know, is basically this modification where instead of computing the minimum value of a set of finite UIs here, you would compute minus gamma log of the sum of exponential minus UI divided by gamma, okay? So this thing here is usually called the generating function of the set of UIs. I mean, there's many different names. It has, of course, a lot of relations to normalization constants in statistical models, etc. Now, by just doing this modification, can we basically get rid of this non-differentiability? 
Well, in this case, it sounds pretty easy, right? Because here, indeed, we are minimizing over a finite set. Here, as far as I went for now, this was a continuous set. It was a polytope. So we might need some adjustment. So let me just first talk about DTW and how this can be done with DTW. So the idea of using the soft mean is very intuitive, of course. In this case, what we get is that by letting gamma be 0, we recover the mean. And then increasing gamma, we get something that's eventually more and more convex that will converge actually to a sum of all those terms. So in the case of a parabola, it will just be a parabola. But then in between, you have this interesting behavior where everything is differentiable and uh, smooth also. Uh, and then you also have somewhat a convexities that start, non-convexities that start blurring out a bit. So from a computational perspective, there are a few advantages. Now, if you just look at this quantity, so if I just look at, replace my mean by a soft mean with a gamma parameter which is strictly positive, what I recover is this big sum. So it turns out that this big sum actually was studied uh, a few years ago by, by me and my, my former advisor. And it's basically it what's called the global alignment kernel. But if you just look at the, the real, the soft mean, what you want to see is whether computing this is any different than computing this. And the, the, the thing is, the math is actually very nice in this sense. Uh, here we just define the mean, and here this is the soft mean. Well, it turns out that you can compute this by just using a soft mean in the Bellman recursion. So somewhat these two quantities are related because in their computation, you can also compute them by taking the soft mean of those three elements instead of taking the hard mean. And now, of course, if you just start doing the chain rule, everything is much better behaved. Now we have a gradient. This is the differentiable function. What you get is if you take the gradient of this with respect to the cost matrix, you have that this gradient is basically a, uh, an expectation of a path under a Gibbs distribution. So we remember, this is a function of delta, as seen as a function of delta. You will see a, delta is an n times m matrix. So its gradient is a n times m matrix. And the gradient of this quantity is basically just uh, the expected path under what we call the Gibbs distribution associated with this, this uh, energy. Now, the question is, how can we compute this expected path? And this is where automatic differentiation will, will, will play a role. Because if you try to compute this expectation, this path using the Bellman equation, and actually you can generalize this Bellman equation to matrices, it's possible, but it has a complexity of order n4. So it's not a clever way. But what we know, of course, is that if I need quadratic time to compute the forward path, uh, path of, my, uh, of this uh, soft dynamic program, then I need quadratic time to compute the gradient using backpropagation. And so I'm going to not go too much into the details of this backprop because it's always tedious. And then, of course, it can be done automatically. Well, although in this case, it's probably better to program it yourself rather than let TensorFlow uh, uh, handle it directly because there are some stability issues, numerical issues that you want to take into account. But let me just say that basically the idea of backprop here is if you want to compute the gradient of your DW score with respect to the x, you will first compute this with respect to the delta and this with respect to the delta. So this is the real important thing to compute because this Jacobian is basically a uh, the square Euclidean distance. So this, uh, this gradient here, you can compute it using backpropagation. So you will start at the last item that you have computed in the forward pass and then differentiate. So I think this is called the dual values of this, of this computation. Differentiate the, the last value with respect to each of the intermediate values. It, in this case, the intermediate values Rij with differentiate with respect to delta Ij is just equal to 1, if you remember the, the recursion. And so you just have that this, this, uh, this the gradient is basically the differential of the last item with respect to each intermediate item. And then if you just apply uh, automatic differentiation rule in a slightly clever way, you get that by storing all of the intermediate computations of your forward path, pass, sorry, you can basically recover exactly those dual uh, values for the optimization. And then you get, by just applying a recursion backward, 
and storing things, uh, yeah, uh, of course, in the forward path, you just get this recursion, that this recursion gives you this expected path uh, under the Gibbs distribution. So it's pretty much a, a done deal. If you want to, comp if you compute soft DTW, then you are careful and store all the intermediate values that you get in the forward path. Then you can compute in the backward path the, 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 the gradient with respect to uh, x of this, uh, the, to the cost matrix, and then you apply the Jacobian. And that's also a very easy operation in the square Euclidean cost. So in the optimal transport case, can you do the same thing? So first I told you that I'm going to use a soft min, and I define the soft min mostly for finite values. So you might think about is there a way we could compute this soft mean in the optimal transport case? So let me just consider for that purpose a discrete formulation of optimal transport where I play with contingency tables. That is, my histograms are basically integer valued, and they all sum to the same big integer that might be, let's say, 1,000. So instead of summing to 1 and having histograms that are real valued, I have integer valued histograms that sum to 1,000. And then I can do all of the math of optimal transport in basically the lattice, which is the intersection between this polytope and, uh, and d times d. And then I can compute this, I can consider this, uh, this soft uh, minimum on over, basically I'm summing over all contingency tables that relate my two histograms. Here I have made this simplifying assumption that n equals m is equal to d. And then I just have this quantity. So it turns out that this quantity it's interesting because if you just look at the, what, what was be, before, uh, after the log, minus gamma the log, you can also define a kernel uh, using this. So this is like a generating function kernel. And it turns out that this kernel is a positive definite kernel. So uh, just as in DTW, this quantity, you can prove to be positive definite. The bad news is that this is not tractable. This quantity, unlike the DTW case where everything was easy to compute, where we just generalize Bellman's recursion, there's no way to compute easily this type of quantity. So what we resort to is a different way to smooth our problem. So soft mean doesn't work for optimal transport. But what works is a more, I would say, naive or direct approach, which is to directly regularize the optimal transport problem. So you remember that what I was computing was basically this minimum of P in UAB of this, what I'm just going to do is regularize the problem by making it strictly convex. So entropy of P, and I'm just using the Shannon entropy here, is uh, uh, a one strictly concave function. So minus gamma entropy of P will be a gamma strictly convex function. So now this becomes well posed in, in, in more in a standard way, in the standard way of optimization. And uh, the intuition behind this regularization is is as follows. Imagine I'm trying to compute the optimal transport between this distribution, this density, and this density. So I, here I have two univariate densities. And I just want to find a way to transport them optimally. Well, remember, if I'm discretizing this on a grid of size 100 and 100, then this matrix is times size 100 times 100, so it's size 10,000. But remember, it only has 200 constraints. So it can only be non-zero at up to 200 values. And this is what you observe here. Now, the second I start adding entropy here in the picture, I will try to find a matrix that, that is a bit more blurred out. Okay, here, this matrix, if you look at it, it has extremely low entropy. It is zero everywhere, almost zero everywhere. So as far as entropy goes, this is disastrous, right? So if you just want to add more entropy, you will start see some, in the solution, see some blurs that will pop up. And they will essentially pop up in areas where it's fine to blur a little bit. And by fine to blur it a bit, I mean that both the constraints are not violated and the cost is not increased too much. So this is where basically it doesn't really matter to blur things out a little bit. And of course, if you let gamma go to infinity, what you recover is just the product of the marginals. Okay? What is the product of the marginals? It's basically here the matrix A times B transpose. Okay? So this, this times this will give you this extreme case here. And so the whole idea of this regularized optimal transport is to say that, well, if you're not specifically looking for this, I mean, if you are fine 
having a little blur, then this is oftentimes much, much easier to compute than this. So we end, of course, with BD Frenchman. This is the, 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 two, uh, the two important things for, for in, the, in, the, in this respect. So if you just do first order methods, I mean, uh, sorry, um, for, uh, first order optimality conditions on this equation, you will recover a very nice form, very simply, which is that the solution of this problem must be, so it's a matrix of size n times m, and it will be a matrix which has this very simple factorization. It will be a diagonal matrix of size n, a matrix k, which I call k because we will see that it looks a bit like a kernel, and it's given by a problem, and a matrix v, uh, diagonal of v, which is basically a diagonal of size m. And so in this k here is just the exponential minus the distance or cost matrix mx1. And the reason why I call it a matrix k is, of course, because if this distance, for instance, is the square Euclidean distance, this matrix k is just simply a Gaussian kernel. Okay? So I will not um, detail too much the computation, because the computations are very basic. You just introduce Lagrangian constraints for those two uh, constraints, and then take <laughs> you derivate, and that's it. Now, this gives you the shape. This is the, the first order conditions. Now we need to plug those, uh, those uh, conditions here in the fact that this matrix must satisfy those constraints. And if we do that, what we get is basically that uh, there is one simple update to ensure that this matrix has row sum A, and it's this one. And this is element-wise division of vectors. So I'm going to update. If you just update U by A divided by KV, then you will see that this has the right row sums. And if you change V, by, divine, by, uh, by updating it to b divided by k transpose u, you will see that this has the good column sums. And so the idea of alternating these projections, this uh, updates, is basically called synchronous algorithm. And it's known since the early uh, 20th century. It's also known as the IPFP procedure, RAS uh, algorithm, etc. But synchron was the first to prove that this was convergent. And if you just look at this algorithm, so let me just step, take a step back. I introduced a regularized problem. By simple, optim by simple uh, calculus, I find out that the, the solution has this form. Then very intuitively, by just doing something that's normalization of row sums and column sums, I get those two updates. Synchron proved that it converged. If you look at the computations, they're extremely simple. They just involve the matrix vector product here and here. And so if you just do things a bit uh, cleverly and implement them a bit carefully, you get an algorithm that's extremely easy to parallelize and to run on GPGPUs. And in some cases, it's actually much cheaper than doing a matrix vector product when this matrix product here has a, a good form. And this is particularly the case when you're playing with uh, uh, grids, with, uh, with spatial grids in 2D or 3D. So this gives you a very, very efficient way to approximate optimal transpose. Let me just mention in passing that basically this algorithm can also be interpreted in a far more orthodox way in optimization as a block coordinate ascent on the dual. So if you just write, this is the primal. And if you just write the dual corresponding to this problem, what you get is this thing. So this looks a lot like the Kantorovich dual that I mentioned earlier, except that you remember the, the dual in the optimal transport problem, maybe you remember the constraints where alpha i plus beta j is uh, smaller than the distance between xi and xj, uh, yj to power p. Here we have some kind of soft constraint. We have kind of blurred out the constraint, but it's still there. So we're basically uh, dealing with this uh, constraint in a, in, a, in, a, in a differentiable way. And if you just run this single algorithm, what you just if you, just, if you were to basically optimize with respect to this objective, a very simple algorithm would be something called block coordinate ascent. So we just update alpha so that the gradient with respect to alpha is equal to 0. We just update beta so that the gradient with respect to beta is equal to 0. And then what we get is just simply this, uh, this, uh, this, this, this. What we would get is just canceling the, the, the gradients, and that will give us the updates. OK? Let me just now mention. Another part, which was important in my talk, remember I 
told you about trying to make computations a bit faster, but also I mentioned differentiability. So there's a lot you can say about the differentiability of this of this Wasserstein distance and the regularized Wasserstein distance. So let me just uh, mention that there are two types of differentiability that we might be interested in. The first one is differentiability with respect to the weight. So if I just change the length of those sticks, what happens to Wasserstein distance? Can I have a gradient with respect to this parameter? Sometimes we want to change just the magnitude of the, those sticks. And then, of course, sometimes we want to change the locations. And then also you want to know what happens. You want to have a, an idea of where should the red points move so that basically they, they, uh, in Wasserstein distance sense, this measure is closer to the blue measure. Well, in summary, there are a lot of complicated answers you can give to this question. There's a lot of beautiful math. But if you go just go down to very simple, concrete uh, implementation, nowadays a very easy fix, an easy way to compute those derivatives is, again, to use automatic differentiation. So that's why automatic differentiation appeared in my, in, my, in my title. If you just look at this synchronal algorithm that I mentioned, what it does is, starting from an arbitrary vector, you just run those synchron updates. Eventually, what you will get is simply an approximation of this optimal transport distance after big L iterations. And then what you could define is this up to L iterations approximation of my, my, my distance. You could come up with something more refined than this, maybe, maybe trying to normalize this, but I'm not going to uh, uh, talk about this. But what you can see is that this, is, of course, is very easy to differentiate. If you just look at this, this is just a very simple algorithm that takes a few inputs, locations and weights, and then just forms the distance matrix, forms the kernel matrix. You do a lot of synchron updates, and then you backprop to the rest. And that's, in this case, of course, you prefer to let directly the, the software handle it because there's not no added value in doing it uh, by yourself. So let me just say that this was, pe different people started using this in um, around 2016. And this has been used in, in, in various uh, uh, applications. So I will just very go very briefly through some, <laughs> some, some, some applications. So I have, uh, I have 45 minutes, or? OK, I started three minutes late. So <laughs> I have my three minutes. So the first thing you can say is, of course, a lot of applications is basically um, computing barycenters. That's the first, the 0.0 the, the .0 application of trying to differentiate those losses is, for instance, to compute something that's close to two time series. And so one of the nice things of DTW is that it can compare time series of different length. But here, let me just take two time series of the same length. And then in that case, you can interpolate them in a Euclidean way, right? We just compute the mean of the two vectors. Well, here, you can see that the interpolations in DTW way are a bit stranger. So more they kind of cut through the middle of the time series instead of having those bumps here and there. And so what we've shown in a paper with Mathieu Blondel was that those, those, uh, th these approaches were quite efficient to compute barycenters. And let me just say something that I think is interesting, which is that although we are using smooth estimates, so all of our algorithms are running using this differentiability and gradient descent, et cetera, when we compute the actual objective values using the true DTW, we get better scores for clustering or barycenters using our approach and using directly subgradient, which was proposed before. This means that there is some non-convexity that we're better able to deal with using this regularization. So let me just say that you can use this loss, of course, for clustering. Then you can also use it for prediction. So you want to use it as an output loss. So maybe you want to predict a time series. And you want to be robust to, for instance, changes, and etc. Anyway, so in the optimal transport, of course, I'm not I'm not going to talk to you about this too much, but let me just close this with a picture of <laughs> three shapes which are interpolated in optimal transport sense uh, directly. So this is joint work with Pixar. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>